we could banish all such preconceptions when we read that would be an admirable beginning. Do not dictate to your author. Try to become him. Be his fellow worker and accomplice. If you hang back and reserve and criticize at first, you are preventing yourself from getting the fullest possible value from what you read. But if you open your mind as widely as possible, then signs and hints of almost imperceptible fineness from the twist and turn of the first sentences will bring you into the presence of a human being unlike any other. Steep yourself in this, acquaint yourself with this and soon you find that your author is giving you or attempting to give you some thing far more definite. I've just recited a piece from a charming essay that Virginia Woolf wrote in 1925, How One Should Read a Book. She'd have been rightly scandalized with this violation <laughs> of her elegant prose, which I've turned into stately hexameters, the regular meter of epic and epigrammatic poetry in antiquity. The point of the exercise at Woolf's expense is simply to demonstrate that it's easy to turn any slab of prose into a metrical verse form like dactylic hexameter. If you're prepared to abandon the natural stress of the language and force a template on the words so that they're compelled to fit irrespective of natural intonation. With an arbitrary imposition of emphases, it's nevertheless remarkable how often the beat aligns with the natural cadence of English. The coincidence is around a half, a proportion in the same order of magnitude as the overlap of long syllables with the natural intonation of Greek words in ancient poetry. My contention has been that assigning an emphasis by long syllables in Greek prosody is no more linguistically logical or poetic or intelligent than assigning an emphasis at random to our syllables in English. I wanted to use the performative platform of video to demonstrate these audio phenomena in a way that you can hear. A part of the problem with ancient Greek metrics is that scholars propose their scansion without ever being obliged to recite it. And even if they did recite it, you, you probably wouldn't mind that the rhythms don't correspond with the intonation of the language, because it isn't your language. It's nobody's language, insofar as ancient Greek is different to Demotic Greek, and modern Greeks, who actually know better, are tolerant of foreigners pronouncing archaea badly anyway, so it isn't going to bother anyone much if I botch the elocution. But if I babble away in English, in a way that's consonant with the arbitrary misshape and hash that quantitative meter imposes, it's easier to recognize that it's God ugly. In this video, I'll handle two further likely objections to my analogy, which risks implying that identifying meter is a of little poetic value and b confusing and mystifying unless it respects the spoken tongue. I'm suggesting that the whole science of Greek prosody, metrics, is little but a well-established delusion which as was already foreshadowed in the early 19th century, inclines us to fantasy. So the first objection that could be raised against me is technical. What you've done with Wolf, Nelson, is to sling the emphasis on any syllable by mechanical imposition, and it's only a coincidence if it hits the right one. Your caricature, therefore, poses no analogy to the correct scansion of Greek poetry by long and short syllables. When we scan Greek poetry, we're not licensed to plonk the emphasis on any syllable whatsoever, but only on validly and scrupulously identified long syllables. Nelson has missed the point. So that's technically correct. When I turn Wolf into verse, I pay no attention to whether the syllables are long or short. 
but then it's hard to do when English meter in any case doesn't operate that way. And it's also true that the quantitative system of reading ancient verse functions by identifying long and short syllables and inducing the emphasis exclusively on the long ones. Uh, well, that may be true, but it isn't the whole truth. The quantitative system, while subtle for students, is sometimes quite roomy. And this explains what was observed since the 19th century, that everyone has a different way of inflecting the verse. The rules for identifying long syllables are, let's just say, tolerant. First, you have to look for vowels that are long by nature, such as an eta or omega. They're nice examples, as noted earlier, because they have short counterparts, epsilon and omicron. But diphthongs also qualify as long, which makes sense, because technically they're two sounds run together, which might be imagined to take a bit longer to pronounce. Think of some English, um, cream, bone, awkward. They're long. That makes sense. And in other languages too, like Goethe, as opposed to Schiller. But second, you have to look for vowels that are long by position. And this distinction can be identified, for example, with the first word of the line, uh, even if it's a tis with a yota, or strangely, when the vowel is followed by two consonants. Exactly why one imagines that these consonants lengthen the vowel sound rather than shorten it is unclear to me, given that we say in modern languages that a double consonant shortens the preceding vowel. In English, we lengthen the vowel before single consonants so much that the sound often becomes a diphthong. Think of time or line, they're long, as opposed to skinny or tinny, short, or say tinsel. Different multiple consonants also have a shortening effect, as in freckle. Think of an O in German, say, das Los or das Lob, which is long, against die Sonne or die Wonne or Sommersprossen, since someone mentioned freckles. They're short. Or the E in Italian, la cautela, long, against stella, bella, relatively short in front of those double L's compared to cautela. But let's not argue about the reasons. Let's just give the system and its professors the benefit of the doubt. The thing is, when you apply the rules of quantitative scansion to identify long vowels in ancient Greek, you rapidly accrue more than you actually need. To begin with, there are almost as many long vowels as short. Then there are some that can be either alpha, yota, ypsilon. Given that you have to count all the diphthongs as long and all the vowels that happen to sit in front of a double consonant, and Greek is full of them, that's amounting to quite a superabundance. You can even have a good number in a row where for most regular old rhythms, like dactylic or anapestic, say, you're only going to want one in three. So what you then do among the surfeit is pick the ones that you like because they're at a comfortable distance from the last one that you chose and the next one that you're about to choose. Lots of long syllables have to be discarded as unworthy of bearing the ictus or beat. But meanwhile, these neighbouring long syllables have to be accommodated to the value of two short syllables. At first, it's disconcerting to see that the rhythm isn't evenly dactylic in the sense of dam didi, but at time goes dam dam, and these burdensome spondies mop up the excess long syllables. Because everything in quantitative metre, true to its title, is measured. It has the air of scrupulosity, but it seems more arbitrary the more you follow its logic. And yes, it's systematic if you count all the lumps as a necessary part of the system. It can't go wrong because all the wrong bits are also part of the right method. 
So I don't give absolute credence to the consistent rule-based character of quantitative metre because though it consistently induces the emphasis on only the long syllables, which includes the short ones that are elongated by position, it can hardly fail to do so by subsuming all its irregularities as the very basis of its consistency. I'll admit that it's fun to scan by long and short, but only because it involves judgments about how you'll fit in the necessary number and you have to be inventive. But it isn't a convincingly logical or natural system. It always relies on the kind of template that I've imposed on the lines by Virginia Woolf, where I know that each line has to begin with the beat and end with the feminine cadence and have four darm titties or lumpen substitutes between them. I guess you can call it systematic, but it's a system that lets you be mighty arbitrary. It's a bizarre way of justifying a forced template on the words that half the time don't want it. Okay, well, the second objection is that I don't have a better system to scan or perform the lines. Now that's also true. I mean, I could suggest that it's better to read Greek verse as if it were prose, because at least it's honest and only thus is the natural intonation of the words respected. I could suggest that it's better to learn the language that way and practice your Greek with the correct tonos and concentrate on the meaning. But that doesn't bring us to understand meter. It seems like giving up. So yes, I'll admit that reading Greek poetry as prose would make no effort to recognise it as verse, as say, dactylic hexameter. And I do think that Homeric epics were conceived as dactylic hexameter. The Greeks themselves in the classical period referred to hexameter. It's a real historical thing, not an invention by grammarians. And it's wise to go seek it in the, in the text. I concede then that I don't have a better system that I could recommend to students. But that doesn't mean that the one we're stuck with is any good. So to defend myself, I'd break up the question into two. First, a logical quibble, and second, more importantly, the underlying explanation um, of why the system is both somewhat workable and fundamentally broken at the same time. In logic, it's inadmissible to claim a proof on the basis that no one can come up with a better answer. An example is the origin of the universe. I have no idea how the stars and the planets came into existence, but just because I don't know a better explanation, it doesn't mean that we necessarily owe it to God. The origins of the universe may indeed be God, but you can't prove it by the fact that I don't have an alternative explanation. In essence, this God of the gaps argument has it that anything that can't be explained by science can safely be put down to God, at least until science advances further. Great unexplained phenomena could provisionally be put down to God, and I guess that's the weak concession that I'm making in agreeing. Let's read dactylic hexameter as if the orthodox rules are correct. And why I'm comfortable with this compromise is that I can easily explain how dactylic hexameter, for example, came into being with those strange six emphases that often don't respect the sound of Greek words. The Greeks had a fabulous aesthetic sense revealed in their architecture, their sculpture, painted ceramics and prose. How did they get it so wrong with their prosody that they'd actually impose an artificial scheme on their language that distorts the natural intonation of its beautiful words. The reason is simple. It's that the lines were chanted to music. Music is a compelling sonic order that overrides every lexical conception that you add to it. You can probably think of examples from popular music 
I used to play tennis at a suburban club. Every so often someone brought a radio that would blare on some popular channel. And on one occasion I heard a song that I've never forgotten. It went, I love you love, everybody loves. I wonder if the reason that it's stuck in my mind is just that it's so metrically wrong when everybody cannot be twisted into everybody without doing violence to the word that native speakers pronounce correctly since they were tiny. Music just steamrollers language as the supreme art of pitch and pulse. It's much more powerful than poetry and it co-opts whatever syllables it needs. For music, it's immaterial whether or not the beat coincides with the natural intonation of the words. The music will insert an emphasis by its unswerving rhythm, regardless of the agreement with natural language. I don't need to convince you with loads of examples, because the same scholars who insist on the regularity and logic of quantitative metre in ancient Greek prosody themselves confess that vocal music has no need of a metrical libretto. Insofar as ecclesiastical choral music interprets scripture, it's prose, even though the Psalms have verse-like line breaks in the Vulgate and the text seems somewhat rhythmical, but it's not metrical. We must never forget, says Vilamovitz Mölndorf, that the Christians were habituated to singing translations of the Psalms, that is, a wholly unrhythmical, artless, characterless text done into prose, and the liturgical pieces were also prosaic, freely stylized according to the dominant contemporaneous rhetoric. Although the quote sounds scornful, Vilamovitz Melendorf reserves his judgment, and just as well, because as he would have known thoroughly, Christians would prove the merit of this practice. The text remains as poetic or as prosaic as it is in the Bible, but sacred music from the Renaissance and Baroque rates among the sub most sublime ever written. As far as the musicians are concerned, it doesn't matter how the words are cobbled together in their rhythms, because the music will make other rhythms anyway. If there's overlap, it's probably a good property for mnemonic reasons, but it will neither affect the sense nor the musicality. The musicality is created by the music. Admittedly, the chant of the ancient epic is different to Thomas Tallis or Monteverdi. It's, it wouldn't have been quite so overdetermined by the music because the performance of genre was narrative and folk had to be able to hear the words clearly to follow the story. So I think it's somewhere in the middle, a bit like recitative but with greater rhythmical sway. The audience has come to hear the myth and so one might conjecture that the story has preeminence over the sensuality of the music. But while the poetry has semantic priority, the music will always have rhythmic priority. If it's chanted with a lyre, the instrument and its rhythm will compel the words to bear the beat on any syllable and no one will mind or be aghast that a word is incorrectly accented or drawn out in an unnatural way. The emphasis is installed by the musical beat and it has everyone's blessing. So great is the sway of music that a thoroughly orthodox analyst of quantitative meter, Wilhelm von Christ, suspected in the late 19th century that in certain genres of Greek versification, the music would shift the emphasis or ictus according to which melody was chosen. Music is the perfect poetic commodity because it makes an acceptable kind of verse from randomly accented prose or anything else. You could install a rhythm in your lines as a poet, only to find someone later repurposing the words to a different rhythm. I'll produce an example in the fifth video.
When the Homeric bards assembled their batched utterances, rich in epithets and formulae, it hardly mattered where the six emphases ended up, provided there were roughly enough weighted syllables to jam between them, and of course among them there would be many that were naturally unaccented, and some wouldn't go dum diddy but dam dam. To me this is explanation enough why Greek quantitative metre is functional but also broken. It's functional because it accurately reflects the way that the lines of dactylic hexameter say were divided according to a regular beat of six, and it's handy to have a technique to split the line up into the convenient quanta. It would work fabulously to the strumming sounds of the lyre, but with the voice alone, without the musical support, the divisions are arbitrary and the system, as a purely lexical poetic construction, is therefore broken. It brings the emphasis to the wrong syllables, even when they're justified by artificial rules, and without the lyre to carry the illusion the clash is great. The archaic Greeks knew what they were doing, and their formulae worked for the musical genre that they professed. But as time went on, and the abstraction of the poetic art set in, a purely verbal art without musical accompaniment, the poetic art suffered a derive, a drift from its original purpose and performative method that stripped it of its sensual justifications. The art became pompous, ridiculous, propped up by vacuous terms and distinctions that seemed to be almost interchangeable, like arsis and thesis, depending on which author you read. Poetry, beginning as an honest, ingenuous way of chanting to the lyre, grows into its own by exorbitant levels of pretension to mask the scandals and reproduce them as if these awful offbeats are a clever, unnecessary thing. That tour into the distorted aesthetic conventions at the birth of poetry as an autonomous art is the subject of the next video. But for now, we should conclude that the reason for quantitative metre has nothing to do with imputed differences in language. We cannot assert, as has been accepted in the past, that the quantitative system must be correct because it respects the unique character of Greek language. If I could dispel one falsehood, it's this shibboleth of Greek language having a natural disposition to function according to long and short syllables. All languages have long and short syllables. Some, like Spanish, a bit less than others. English has loads of long syllables, as well as short ones. Loads, steam, jewel, barley, scam, irksome, contrary. It isn't what's happening in the language that determines the poetic conventions. It's what's happening in poetic convention that conditions the language as poetry. And in ancient Greek, the poetic conventions were set by an inbuilt musical metronome, drawing diction along by the compelling lull of the lyre, and there it stuck. The music stopped, but the poets were left chanting with an unsupported embarrassment. So the next phase of poetic history was set to regulate and defend a monstrosity. The task as metrical scholars, therefore, became to bluff and pretend that the Gorgon is the muse herself.